Hello, welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 228 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 2 of A Feast for Crows, which is named The Captain of Guards. Or the Sea of G's, as you wrote in the title of the... Yes, this... uh, setting, setting a task for my memory. Well, as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. Except for in the spoiler section, if you uh, have access to that. But hopefully, overall, we're going to provide you with some entertainment along the way. We'll summarize what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in quite a lot of pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide some additional information about the characters and other things of note of this in this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. It's uh, just another day. <laughs> Anything funny happen to you? Anything we can roll out to the crowd? <laughs> Not really. Well, don't worry. Step step back. Yes. I've got things. All right. Yeah. You <laughs> take stock. Tell me about your taking stock. You you messaged me at work. Uh, was it yesterday or was it today? And said I've got some good witty oh. banter. So you'll you'll, uh, en- you'll enjoy this. Yeah. Well, go on then. I'll, I'll I'll dive in with it. So, Carson and I frequent a bar in our hometown, which is called the Green Monkey. Okay, I, I've uh, heard you mention it. It's, yeah, it's um, it's run by a, a gay couple, uh, Drew and Rusty, who are very nice. They're very welcoming to everyone who goes through their door, and they really make you feel like part of the community when you go there. It's, it's great place. Highly recommended if you're ever in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, the Green Monkey. Go, go pay them a visit. Sounds um, like a, a a great place to uh, to pay. It is, it is, it is for sure. Um, whenever we go, they are effusive about Carson's presence. My wife, they love her, they absolutely adore her, but they also like me. I mean, I'm not like you know completely in the background. They like me too. But <laughs> when Carson arrives, they roll out the red carpet. Um, we went on Sunday. They had mimosas and board games. What's oh, not to like, right? And uh, Carson and I went, and Rusty, who I've talked to 50 times, said, okay, you've got everything you need, Carson and Steve. <laughs> Steve. You good, Steve? <laughs> Welcome to the Ghost of Aerodol. My name's Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember my brother's video where he called me Steve? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's what's going on. <laughs> Rusty, watch that video. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I mean, they're gay. I should be the one they're noticing. <laughs> they, uh, so that was that was a bring you down to earth moment for me. Yeah. Well, you know, Steve, Simon, close enough. Yeah. By the way, my brother, my brother doesn't know this story yet, so he's gonna love hearing oh, this on the yes, podcast. He is. <laughs> I told you about how when uh, the first night that. Stacy and I went out together, not as not as a couple, just went out in a large group together to the bars in college. Yes. And all night I called her Steph. <gasps> until till the end of the night when I mentioned I called her Steph and she goes, My name is Stacy. I was like, Oh man, I wish I'd known that earlier. <laughs> Nobody man. was gonna bail me out. Everybody heard me calling her Steph. Nobody, including my roommate, which is who I met her through. Nobody bothered to say, hey, you're calling this girl by the wrong name. Just so you know. That's terrible. I mean, that's terrible of them. And also, strangely forgiving of your wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was young. We, she was young. We were, uh, you know, yet to begin courting. So, um, My wife's middle name. Do you know what my wife's middle name is? Do you happen to know that? I feel like when you say it, I will I will think uh, I knew that. Her middle name is Macmillan. I did know that. Yes, I yeah. did know that. Be- probably because you've heard this story. When she told me her full name, um, I said, wow, you've got three last names. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't well received. Was intended uh, jovially and uh, friendlyly. But it was <laughs> but not did, well received. Did not come off. Did not come off that way to her. When mm-hmm. uh, shortly after me calling Stacy by the wrong name all night, uh, during the the night she was talking about something. Someone had offended her, and she was 
She's like, I wish I had had a, a good was comeback he, at the time. Was it, was it you? Was it me? <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. I certainly was another person who offended her. <laughs> and so I was trying to think of a way of reaching out to her to e- extend our, um, our, our interactions with one another. Mm-hmm. And so I sent her an email back then in the DOS prompt email system that we had uh, at, yeah, yeah. at our college. And I was just th- like, hey, I thought of some things you could have said, which is incredibly lame. I knew it was incredibly lame going in, but I needed something and I was willing to take a shot. Anyway, I signed off McKelly. And she tells me later, she, she read it and looked to her roommate and said, this guy signed off with his last name. Like, ah! Who just goes by their last name? <laughs> she didn't know your name any better than yeah. you knew hers. Right. So we were wow. destined to be together. Neither of us that... knew the other person's name. <laughs> How weird is that? That is, yeah. I, I, I got to say, you know, in her defense, my name is pretty backward. So she wouldn't be the first or the last to get my name backward. Um. That particular feature is going to crop up later on in our podcast today. Oh, okay. A a name backwards. Uh Oh, yes, it will. Yes, it will. (laughs) I know what you're referring to. Uh, So my other story from this week is um, our microwave stopped working. And our microwave, this is the second time we've had a microwave stop working in a very similar fashion. It um, worked fine. The turntable spun, the light came on, and... The microwaves were hitting the thing because they were getting hot. But when you opened the door, the turntable span and the fan blew. And by implication, the microwaves were cooking. Yes. Uh Uh-huh. I follow you. So I, I began to unplug the microwave before opening the door. But it wasn't very sustainable. Yes, it wasn't very sustainable. So I was of the opinion we should just buy a new microwave because I have become an American. (laughs) <laughs> but Carson, Carson is still, you know, a child of her generation, and she wanted us to call out a repair guy. Now, our fridge isn't working either, so it was like, all right, I, I'll break down. We'll call out a repair guy because he can look at the fridge and the microwave. Okay. Sure, okay, two for one. Uh-huh. His estimate on the uh, microwave was such that we could not legitimately fix the microwave. It was considerably more than buying a new one. <laughs> Then the 60 bucks uh, or something to buy a new microwave, whatever right. microwaves cost these days. <laughs> exactly. So, but we paid him for his time and services. And then we paid exactly 50% of that to buy the replacement <laughs> microwave. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> I thought I was like, that might have been where you were going. <laughs> we're so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but the, th- the thing was I actually after he left I was like well you know we'll just live with this this is this is doable we'll live with it but then then it started to only work when the door was open <laughs> <laughs> just gotta, just leave the mic just leave the food sitting on the counter <laughs> exactly. all right I put the microwave on everyone out of here you know but <laughs> But the other funny thing was the guy who fixed it or tried to fix it, you know, when he was diagnosing it, he sat there right in front of it with the door open, looking in with the turntable spinning, the fan blowing. He clearly didn't think the microwaves were on or he was just tough as old boots and he didn't care. (laughs) Was his nose red when he (laughs) pulled his head out of there? (laughs) I was like, good grief, man. It was like, did you watch Chernobyl? It reminded me of uh, those yes. guys go, right. going in to turn off the... He just didn't care. He was like, ah, oh, fine. I, I got it's it. a microwave. <laughs> well, that's something. Okay, let's get down to business. How did we leave the Captain of Guards? Well, of course, we've never met the Captain of Guards before. We've never been to, drumroll, Dawn before. But we'll remind you of some of the touch points to this story so far. So the Prince of Dawn is Doran Martell, D-O-R-A-N. So Dawn and Doran might get mixed up. Just especially with you saying that. it. With you think so? I, I, I'm worse at that. Yeah. <laughs> or Dawn and Doran. Might... Dawn and Doran. <laughs> <clears throat> Doran's younger sister Elia was married to Rhaegar Targaryen. She was the mother of Rhaenys and Aegon. All three of those, that's Elia, Rhaenys, and Aegon, were brutally murdered by Armory Lorch and Gregor Clegane at the end of Robert's Rebellion. More recently, Doran and Elia's younger brother still, Oberyn, 
had been to King's Landing to seek justice and had met his doom at the hands of the mountain. His paramour, Ilaria Sand, was still in King's Landing last we checked. Oh, and don't forget, Marcella Lannister, oops, Baratheon, was <laughs> in Dawn as a ward and to keep her safe from the fightings in King's Landing. So, McKelly, why don't we give the summary of this one? All right. Well, the captain of guards is Ario Hota. He's Prince Doran's sworn protector. The prince suffers from gout and has been holed up in the water gardens for two years. His maester fashioned him a wheelchair to ease his suffering. The prince spends his days watching children swim in the pools. Hota hears Obara sand stamping toward the prince. The captain's having none of it. The prince wants peace and quiet. Obara is a fighter and rises to the challenge, but Doran calls her over to avoid bloodshed. Obara is Oberyn's bastard daughter, and she wants justice. She wants half the Dornish army to help her burn Old Town, and the other half to be led by her sister Nymeria to march up the King's Road. Doran reminds her that Oberyn died in a duel. It wasn't murder. She marks his meekness. He tells her to go back to Sunspear and await his word. She is neither happy nor appeased. No, she's not. Doran wearily tells Maester Calliot that they must return to Sunspear. The prince fears the trouble that the Sand Snakes, which is the collective noun for Oberyn's bastard daughters, will incite in the populace if he isn't there to keep a lid on things. That means seeing Marcella Baratheon and her protector, Sir Ares Oakhart. Hota is pretty sure that one day he'll have to fight Oakhart, but is already confident that he will kill the other man. The next day, Doran is taken in his litter the three leagues back to Sunspear. Along the way, Nymeria Sand, also known as Lady Nim, rides out for a chat. She's not quite as blunt as her half-sister Obara, but she's just as hell-bent on vengeance. All Doran need do is send Nim and her sister Tyene to King's Landing, and she'll rid the Seven Kingdoms of Cersei, Jaime, Tywin, and Tommen. Doran reminds her that Oberyn was supposed to take the measure of the King's Landing court, not settle 17-year-old scores. Nymeria presses that she won't wait 17 years for her revenge. When the litter arrives at Sunspear, the populace is near rioting. They cry out for their lost prince and for war. Doran recognizes the Sand Snake's unsubtle maneuvering here. When they've made their way through the gates and the crowds, Doran is welcomed by his daughter Ariane. She informs her father that Tyeen Sand waits for him in the throne room. Hota carries the prince to his high seat. Tyene is knitting with golden needles. It's a cloth of her father riding a sand steed so that Doran won't forget his brother. He assures her that he won't. She has the mildest sounding plan of the sisters. Marry Marcella to Doran's son, Tristane, and crown her as Queen of the Seven Kingdoms and then slaughter their enemies when they move against them. Marcella is older than Tommen and Dornish Lawn favours absolute primogeniture over the agnatic primogeniture, with firstborn son, favoured in the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. Doran is sceptical, but agrees to consider it. She accuses Doran of thinking too much. He counters that Oberyn thought too little. She reaches out to Doran, but Hota stamps down his axe. Tyene assures her she meant no harm and asks for Doran's blessing. He rests his hand on her head and tells her to be brave. And she assures him that she will be. She's Oberyn's daughter, after all. Maester Kelliot rushes over when Tyene withdraws to see if she's scratched the prince in a possible poisoning attempt. Determining that no poisoning occurred, Doran asks for milk of the poppy. While the maester prepares, Doran asks Hota if the guards are loyal. Hota assures him that they absolutely are. Then the captain is to take the sand snakes into custody, all eight, including the children, but Tyene, Nymeria, and Obara first. Sorella is away, so she is excused. Leave her to her game, Doran says. Hota warns that the common folk will howl when they hear this news. Doran says that he just hopes it's loud enough for Tywin Lannister to hear and know what a loyal ally he has in Doran. Is this kind of... In some ways, this chapter uh, made me think of A Christmas Carol. Oh, because he, he was visited by the three ghosts. Yeah. Yes, instead of ghosts, they were sand snakes. But he, everywhere, yeah, yeah. every time he tried to go somewhere, he was visited by a, a sand snake. 
Yeah, yeah, and they all basically had the same message for him as well. Yes. You know. <laughs> Change your ways. <laughs> right, before it's too late. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I have to say, I am... I'm really excited about the expansion of the book to the Iron Islands and now to Dawn. It's yeah. it's so much so much and 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 such the beauty of the first three books is that these places lived because they were touched on enough to give right. them a, a life, you know, Oberyn's visit to King's Landing, Theon's visit to Pike, but now we get to actually experience them as well and they are quality additions to the book. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah, although maybe we'll miss uh, Arya's fourteen chapters in the Riverlands, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I could live without. I could I could have done it in twelve. I'm sure. So during during the beginning of this chapter, while they're at the Water Gardens, uh, what keeps happening, and and Arya Hota, the POV character of this chapter, keeps like uh, kind of pointing it out as it happens. Blood oranges continue to fall off the tree. The yeah, you know, the tree that is sitting near the uh, Prince Doran, and splattering when they hit the ground. And I just wondered if possibly that could have been a metaphor. Well, yes, it could. Um, I'm not sure what for. Is it is it his calm amongst the destruction around him? Is it are they they can't wait and they are killing themselves? Well, yeah. So so my thought was possibly. So yeah, it, these oranges fall and they splatter red juice on the ground when they do so because they're blood oranges. And I thought it was possibly just kind of a backdrop to the chapter about Dorne's desire for blood. First for Elia and the children and now for Oberyn. And at one point, one of the um, oranges falls and our Ario notices that Dorne winces at the sound as if it hurt him. And, uh, you know, it just... Just made me think they could have been could have been lemons, limes, navel oranges, pretty much any citrus fruit falling from that tree. But it wasn't. It was blood oranges, and Dorne is out for blood. And I just thought maybe there was some some association there. But you're saying Dorne was out for blood, not Doran, because he doesn't Dorne. seem like he's yes. out for blood. He he actually seems like he's willing to make peace with the people that the people of Dorne blame for Oberyn's death. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. The the uh, kingdom of Dorne yeah. is out for and, blood. And timing wise it's interesting because they're talking about Tywin in the present tense, so his that news hasn't reached here yet. Right. Yes. But but actually now I think about that, I I'm 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 going off script here just a little bit, but uh they didn't mention Tyrion. In Right. Yeah. When uh, Ny- uh Tyene was offering to no, no, it was no, Nymeria. Yeah. Yeah. N- yeah, Nim was offering to assassinate the entire Lannister clan, but she didn't mention Tyrion. And I wonder if that's because they've heard that Oberyn believed in Tyrion and was fighting for him. I mean, they must have heard that, I presume. I think one of the three says in... the. I, I keep getting the conversations with the three. They're very similar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One of the three says... That we ha- I, it might have been Tyene because she was the one talking about the wedding uh, plans for Marcella and Tristane. But one of, one of the three says that we have Tyrion to thank for Marcella, which is why I think it, it must have been Tyene that said that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Possibly they find him harmless. Possibly they feel they owe him a little bit for sending them Marcella. Of course, they, it was the reason he sent Marcella was not so that they could crown her and <laughs> and uh, create and start a war but uh, you know possibly they just think him not very useful i guess but the idea that that might happen was talked about in king's landing yes uh, even before joffrey's death i believe yeah I, I think cersei voiced her concerns first that you're basically sending her to be a prisoner there yeah so the pov of this chapter is ario hota um he is I mean, usually we get the inner thoughts of the POV person. We do to a certain extent here, but he is really just a witness to what's going on. He His his actual interactions are very marginal. He's clearly very trusted by Doran. Um, yeah. But 
he didn't he didn't have an awful lot to say. It is interesting that he's taken the measure of Aris Oakheart as if he he knows that one day all of all of these shenanigans with the sand snakes and uh and Oberyn's death are going to lead to him having to fight and kill the king's guard who's protecting Marcella. But right. I wonder if he I wonder if he means that I wonder what Oakheart's behavior would be if they try to crown Marcella. Because on the one hand that's not a threat to her, right? But would he intervene for his paymasters back home in King's Landing? Oh yeah, that's a good question. It is, but the, but the thing is, if it's not that, which I, I think he would stand by and let that happen. He's just a king's guard. He's just protect her personally, right? Yeah, he's not involved in the politics exactly. But then Hota therefore must be trying thinking he's going to kill him because they're going to kill Marcella. Right. And that that was something that struck me as well is why does he think what 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 is this premonition? Like you said, is it about all the turmoil going on in Dorne and he's thinking it's only a matter of time before something happens and I'm going yeah, to yeah. have to kill or, him. Or maybe, like you said, think think of it more as a premonition. Maybe he's thinking that at some point Oakheart's gonna smell things going on in Dorne and say oh. to himself I'm going to rescue this child and take her home. That could be too. Yeah. And that might be where he has to fight her because they want to keep her. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, like you said, though, we, we've had several non-major characters get POVs, Chet, Pate, Merritt. But in each instance, they were kind of the star of that chapter. They were the one right. with the agency doing the things. Here, life is just going on around Ario. And he's just kind of taking it all in, and we're getting his thoughts while he takes it all in. We could have had Doran Martell's. That would have been, that would have been what you would have expected, yes. based on yes. how the previous three books have gone. We would have gotten Doran Martell's. But you know, here we're just getting this guy who's just watching everything happen. Now, I he's from just real quick. He's originally from Norvos, which is uh, one of the free cities of Essos. He was sold to the bearded priests, and we're going to hear about the bearded priests again when we get to background. So I'll just give you a little teaser about that. And actually, just trying to think of a of a similarity, maybe Davos and Stannis constitute a similarity here. We don't get the POV of the primary character. We get the POV of somebody who's always in his presence. Yeah, that... That, yeah, that, that's definitely some similarities. Davis has a little more action, like specific action that he's taking in his chapters. But yeah, let's let's see him go to tour with Eris Oakheart, shall we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the whole chapter begins at the Water Gardens and ends in Sunspear. Uh, they're both on the far east coast of Dawn. Um, if you think of Dawn as the foot of Westeros... Then some spear in the water gardens at the end of the toe in the east. And some people have pointed out that um, Westeros actually looks like the United Kingdom flipped east-west. Oh. So so this okay. would be a sort of Cornwall part of uh, sort of like... There's, there's, there's two points at the end of Cornwall. One called Land's End and the other one called Lizard Point, which are the furthest west and south points of mainland England. Okay. And they are, but these would be on the flipped. east side. Yes. Yes. Flipped. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I never knew that, but it makes sense. It's, it's, if you look at it, it kind of, you can kind of see it, but it's just the right shape. That's all. I don't think he was actually copying it. <laughs> he was, he was tracing it, but he had the, he had the <laughs> negative flip backward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so King's Landing and Storm's End are in Wales by this. Right. Token. Yes. Okay. I get you. So let's talk about the Sand Snakes, shall we? We, uh, we meet three of the eight in total. Uh, we'll just, we'll just take them one by one as we meet them, I guess. The first, uh, the first sand snake we meet is Obara Sand. She is the oldest. Uh, take say that she's twenty eight, and she is the daughter of an old town prostitute. Now, there's some interesting timing here. Now we know that Oberyn spent time at the Citadel, uh, but we get we get some ages, some very specific ages. Through Doran's thoughts, we learn that he is fifty two years old. And he tells Obara that he is 10 years older than her father, Oberyn. 
which okay. makes Oberyn 42. Yes. We also get a specific age here for Obara. She's 28, which means that Oberyn, her father, is only 14 years older than her, if my rudimentary math serves. Uh, considering the, the gestation period of a baby, he very well fathered Obara at 13. Okay. Does that seem a bit young? No, it's not really young, because now we know the age of novices at the Citadel, and he would have been about the right age to be at the yeah, Citadel Pate, at that time. Yeah, Pate started when he was 13. So right, it's okay. possible that he fathered her. We also know that he and Elia spent some time in Old Town on their way up to Lannisport, or on their way up to Castle Rock to visit the Lannisters. And do we know when that was? It was when... Tyrion was a newborn baby. I I, I knew that. I, was, I wanted <laughs> I wanted a timeline. I, how old is Tyrion? I looked it up and I forget. That's why I was just saying when he was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but one thing that uh, that Ario mentioned or, or thinks about, he recalls that Doran tells to his daughter Ariane, is that Obara is chasing something that she can never catch. And I, I wondered if that is possibly the fact that she is the least secure in being her father's daughter. And Go, also, what do you mean? Well, yeah, so one of the things that basically the way that Oberyn claimed Obara was he he was in Old Town, went to the went to her mother in Old Town and tried to claim his daughter, and she said no, you can't take her. I don't even think that she's yours. I've been with a thousand men before you. And Oberyn threw, the, threw his spear at Obara's feet and slapped her mother and had Obara choose. And she picked up the spear instead of attending her mother who was crying about being slapped. And that's when Oberyn said, see, I told you she was my daughter. Not, not, not the most scientific paternity no, test but 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 you're right it could give her feelings of inferiority if the other sand snakes can point to their definite lineage she right. has there's just a little bit of dubiousness about hers yes and her mother is also the least uh lofty of the right. uh, of the daughter's mother's because Nymeria, who's 25, her mother was a volunteer noble woman. So she actually has right. a bit of nobility on both sides. Yes. And well, we don't really know a lot about Nymeria yet, but Tyene, she is 23, so two years younger than Nymeria. She is described as fair and with golden hair, which is very unlike the rest of her sisters. Right. And her mother was a septa. And I bet there's an interesting story there, how Presumably. that came about. Uh, I, I wish Oberyn was around to tell us, but he is. Uh, yes. So. And then the fourth named one is Sorella, who is out of Dawn playing her games, uh, as Doran puts it. So uh, she's excluded from the uh, call to round them up and imprison them. But we don't know where she are, where she is. But... Uh, We'll talk more in spoilers. Right. Yes. I'm looking forward to that. And then Alaria, which we've met Alaria. She, she's uh, Oberyn's paramour that was in King's Landing with him. Uh, she has four daughters ranging from age 14 to 7. So okay. they were they were rounded up as well just because even though he Doran thought they were too young to be any harm, he was afraid someone might try and use them to force Doran's hand. So they were rounded up for their safety, basically. Yeah. And it seems like they all, all these sand snakes have their father's wild spirit. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yes. They, if, if Obara's father is not Oberyn, then her mother knew another guy who was a lot like Oberyn. <laughs> That's, That's for a, sure. <laughs> that might be the better paternity test <laughs> right. than the, the slap in the spear. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever known anyone like this before? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Obara says that Doran has two hosts already in the Prince's Pass and the Boneway, but I didn't know quite what she meant by that. Bail me out here, McKelly. 
Well, so the Princess Pass and the Boneway are just both routes that lead north and south, leading to and from Dorne. Yeah. It was it was part of the agreement. Li- likely those hosts are there because part of the agreement that Tyrion and Doran made for the Marcella and Tristane betrothal was Doran moving troops into the passes to keep the Marcher Lords at home and not join the war I uh, see. against the I Lannisters see. on Stannis' side. Right. The Sand Snakes paint a picture of near revolt if Doran doesn't act, and clearly when he arrives, that is going on. The the, the people of uh, Sunspear are crying out, literally crying out for the death of Prince Oberyn and for revenge against those who did it. Um, and throwing citrus fruits, but not, <laughs> didn't appear to be blood oranges, though. It was okay. mostly lemons and limes and pomegranates. <laughs> so, But, you know, that as I'm sure we'll talk more about, it puts... It puts Doran in a really tough spot because Oberyn willingly offered himself as Tyrion's champion in the trial by combat if the letter that came from Tywin is to be believed. So it's hard for Doran to to rise Doran up in rebellion under such circumstances. Yeah, I... I completely agree. I mean, I I understand the the rage that they must feel, but... It's misplaced when you volunteered. You volunteered, you fought someone, you lost. Right. It, that is not the fault of the other six kingdoms. Right. Yeah. So it's... You certainly understand Oberyn's yeah. daughters being upset by the loss of their father, but... Indeed. Yeah. It, it maybe, is maybe, this is. Isn't, maybe this is us being old, McKelly, but... I see the two of us as most like Doran Martell. We're sitting in our bath chair <laughs> with our gouty feet up saying, <laughs> we're not fighting over this. He's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I can see us doing just that. <laughs> so, But none of the sand snakes are happy with just the mountain's head as payment for the killing of uh, Oberyn and Elia. Obara wants to torch Old Town, which seems pretty unrelated to what's going on. Maybe maybe she it wants does. to get rid of her mother somehow. Well, her, her mother had died. Uh, oh, right. That was part of that story. She died within the year, I think. Oh, uh, that's but, right. She did, yeah. But the fact that she came from Old Town, you know, pro- probably from very humble beginnings, uh, you know, could be why she dislikes the town so much. I, I think it's it's also kind of like one of the most readily reachable of the major yes. cities of the rest of the kingdom yeah that is a good point as well yes yeah she also talks about wanting to kill tywin herself which feels kind of hard to do from old town even yeah, if yeah. he were alive yeah so, <laughs> so send nymir to king's landing where i will kill <laughs> yes. tywin hmm. not sure you understand how this is gonna work <laughs> Uh, Lady Nymeria wants uh, to kill Jamie, Cersei, Tywin, and Tommen. And she also points out that, it, it, correctly so, that the Lannisters are paying Dorne with their own coin by giving them Gregor Clegane's head because Oberyn stuck the mountain with the poison multiple times and they've they've received word that this happened. So they're pretty confident that Gregor Kagane is going to die. Right. You the, know. The, Tywin is offering them the head of someone who Oberyn killed. So right. literally and, nothing is what they're offering. And that is exactly what Tywin told Grand Maester Pycelle he was trying to prevent and commanded that Grand Maester Pycelle keep the mountain alive so that right. they could kill him, so that they could send him to Dorne. Yeah. Uh, but, you know... She also mentions that, so Doran points out, you, you mentioned that Nymeria wants to kill Jamie, Cersei, Tywin, and Tommen. And Doran points out, well, Tommen didn't do anything. He's innocent in any harm against us. And Nymeria says that he's an abomination born of incest if Stannis is to believe. If Stannis is to believe, so is Marcella. Well, so, that's true. Yes. That's true. But then, to be fair to Nymeria, she never said, let's marry her to Tristane. Right. That was her she, sister's plan. She's probably the one telling Hota, you're going to have to kill that Aerys fella eventually when we decide to get rid of that abomination. <laughs> maybe that's how that... May, yeah, maybe that's where that thought came from. Oh, and 
Nymeria mentions that she was abed with the Fowler twins when she got the news of Oberyn, her father's death. That's Jane and Jenelyn Fowler. They're blonde twins and good friends with Nymeria, in case you're wondering who she was abed with in that moment. Okay. And then Tyene, as we said, seems to have the most thought out plan of, that they'll marry Tristane to Marcella and proclaim Marcella queen of the Seven Kingdoms. She's older than Tommen and women uh, have uh, there's absolute primogeniture in Dawn. And so by Dornish rules, she would be queen of the Seven Kingdoms. Right. But of course, this is going to cause consternation in the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. So they just have to wait for the Lannisters to invade to stop the challenge against Tommen's rule and they'll destroy the host as it comes in through the sand, through the mountainous terrains and the sands like they've always done with every previous invading host. Exactly. And that sounds an awful lot like the idea that Oberyn floated to Tyrion during their conversation when he offers to be his champion against Gregor. It, it, It was down to the point where he said... He asked if how Tywin and Cersei would wage war against Marcella. Would they actually go and do that? And, and now with Tywin dead, I wondered when I read this part, what would Cersei do? Would she go to war against her own daughter? At the very least, Marcella is a captive and could be killed if she went to war against Dorne. But, but actually them crowning her would give her a degree of protection. I, I think... I think you ignore Dawn, you know, I mean, especially while you're, you know, the Seven Kingdoms are not in a great state at the moment and you need to lick your wounds a little bit and prepare for winter. Let them have their queen in Dawn who can't rule any of the rest of the Seven Kingdoms because no one believes in her legitimacy as queen. Tommen is in King's Landing with a crown on his head. Possession is nine tenths of the law. That's. That is a good point you make right there. I wondered, was there any chance that Cersei might like the idea of her daughter ruling the Seven Kingdoms? We, we know she's dreamed of being a man and ruling herself. Would she see herself and her daughter? I don't think she'll poison Tommen, if that's what you're getting at. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, she, I mean, Tommen's pretty, pretty uh, you know, easygoing and malleable. They might just say, you know what, Tommen, we miscalculated <laughs> Right. You're they could actually do that. not king. <laughs> and and that's true, actually. I mean, if you think about it, there is now a little bit of a power vacuum in King's Landing. Cersei has very little constraints against her anymore. With Tyrion fleed and Tywin dead. Yeah. Who's to Kevin. stop her? Kevin and Jamie are the only ones that... She could send Kevin back to, to the Westlands. She could just say go. She could. She could. And and then she could say, you know what? Let's bring her back. She can be married to Tristane. Let them rule from here, but I want them back. Yeah, maybe. Although, I've got to say, if I was the Martells, I would be very hesitant to send one of my children to King's Landing to marry the r- ruling family. Yeah, hasn't worked out well. No, it really hasn't. <laughs> but So there's something I was a little bit confused about in this chapter. So did Doran tell Obara and Lady Nim different stories about Oberyn's objective in King's Landing? Do you know what I'm referring to? Well, he definitely, she definitely, he definitely told Nim that he was there to get the measure of King's Landing. Yes, he was there to take stock of Joffrey, assess their strengths and weaknesses, and find friends, and don't unduly provoke Tywin. But earlier, he told Obara he was. They were looking at the children playing. He commanded her to watch because she didn't care to. And he was talking about how she used to play in that out in these these water these pools, and that her father before, and that he did when he was a boy. And she he was talking about how even though Oberyn was a little boy, he would topple bigger, stronger boys. Oberyn promised Doran he would do that one more time, or else he wouldn't have let him go to King's Landing. To me, that sounds like Oberyn saying, I'm going to go there and kill Gregor Clegane. Yeah, right. And Doran accepting it. Yes. Uh, and that's the exact yeah. opposite of what he said to Nymeria. So maybe I was misunderstanding what he meant by that. I read it so many times. 
using different uh, emphasis, you know, to see if I could figure out if he meant something else. I just kept coming back to, I think he's saying that he knew he was going to go kill Gregor. Interesting. So, I, I didn't you know. pick up on it, but now you said it, I am now suspicious of that as well, which goes to my conclusion for all of this. My conclusion for all of this is don't underestimate, don't underestimate Prince Doran Martel. He is cautious and slow, but yes. he is thinking about things and he is plotting things. Right. And yeah. so that, what you've just said there, no longer surprises me. It would have surprised me nine tenths of the way through that chapter to learn that he'd basically agreed to let Oberyn go and kill Gregor Clegane. But now I'm like, actually, that rings true to me now. He's a schemer. If I'm reading it the way that I described it, yeah. then it feels like he might have known. But why would he tell Obara that, of all people? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe to big up himself, to say... No, I wanted this. Right. Yeah. Your dad just messed up. But then he tells a different story to her sister, and you'd have to think they're going to compare notes at some point. Anyway. In their cells. I will say, oh, this, this whole thing, news of Tywin's death hasn't made it here. It's going to make it here, and probably news of Gregor Clegane's death is going to make it here. Is that enough? Because, yeah. again... They're not paying with any coin of their own making. Right. But they are paying a heavy price. Those are t those are the two people who are... Well, there are three people who are who are implicated. Tywin, Armory Lodge, and uh, Greg, Greg Ockergain. They will all three be dead. Right. Yes. And not, none of them at the hands of the Dornish. Right. So what do you want at that point? Right. Yeah. That's Vengeance becomes diffuse and pointless yeah i think it was tyeen when doran said that they will be getting gregor clegane's head she said something along the lines of that's not like that's not good enough we've wished for his death so long it's only fair that he should wish for his death <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah yeah that was a good line yes um Doran hesitated before touching Tyene. He and also Hota intervened before she let before he let Tyene touch Doran. Uh, but but even when that was done, she asks for a blessing and he touches her on the head. But he's kind of hesitant to do it. Now we know that the Dornish dabble in poisons, but this seems very afraid of his niece. Effectively, yeah. I don't feel like it's been long enough that he hasn't acted, that they would actively try and kill him. You know, like... Right. Yes. It's, it hasn't been that long that he yes. hasn't yes. taken action yet. Yes. So. He, he hasn't formally announced there will be no action. He just hasn't done anything yet. Right. They could still yeah. convince him. But I, I guess, uh, you know, uh, Maester Calliot, I guess he's a, he's a cautious man. Yeah. Just wants to... To uh, make sure there's no chance that she uh, pulled any funny business there. Yeah, but but as I was saying, I love the switcheroo because because really, Doran Prince Doran comes across as so careful and so cautious that he's pretty much a coward. But then that switcheroo at the end when he gets Hota to go arrest them all is just it's it's not the bravest thing you've ever heard, and particularly when you hear he's trying to appease Tywin Lannister, which is the last person we would want him to appease, but. Uh, He's playing the Game of Thrones, this guy. Yeah, you know, this chapter ends leaving you wonder, what is Dorn Martell? Is he weak? Or is he patient? Or is he planning something of his own that he doesn't want the Sand Snakes to, to ruin? That last line about Tywin knowing he's got a good friend in Dorn, it sounds at the surface like he's on Team Lannister despite Oberyn's death. I mean, that's po that's very, very possible. You know, he, he... He he could blame Oberyn for his own death. Exactly. Not unfairly. Yes. And but now, factoring in what you just said about him possibly sending Oberyn to kill the mountain. Right. Maybe knowing that Oberyn might very well die at the hands of the mountain. 
that this might create the scenario that is now taking place, ridding him of the Sand Snakes, potentially, for their okay. inability to follow rules. And now he's ingratiated himself with Tywin in some ways by not attacking. Now, Tywin's death is going to foul all this up, but he's planning something, I think. Yeah, you know, taking the Sand Snakes into custody feels like he's trying to prevent them from riling up Dorne any further. Right. You know, although he might inadvertently start a civil war with that action, you know, that's that's one of the possible consequences. Um, Or, like you said, is he, does he have his own plan and he doesn't want the Sand Snakes inadvertently getting in the way of their plan with their individual efforts? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, you know, maybe it's, possible he's playing some long game that we're just not privy to yet now in the spoiler section we are going to discuss a little bit about how things actually do play out but at this point we just don't we don't know what dormar tells up to okay now we're just going to do spoilers uh, the spoiler section is available to the highest tiers of our sustainers so uh, join at those levels if you want to get on in on the spoilers all right to background all right so Oreo thinks about his time with the bearded priests of Norvos. Norvos is one of the free cities of Essos, and we'll, we'll talk more about the city in general at another time. Just wanted to focus on the bearded priests at this point. And Oreo mentions that he was sold by his mother to the bearded priests as he was the youngest of six siblings, and he was a big, hungry boy to boot. And so it was a little too many mouths to feed, I guess. So who are these bearded priests? Well, the roots are actually in Valeria. However, they left the freehold because of poor religious tolerance in Valeria. Nowadays, they're religious leaders in Norvos. In fact, many consider them to be the true rulers of Norvos, as it's the bearded priests who select the city's magisters using a method of divine inspiration. Unfortunately, Ariel was not alone in being sold by his family. Many unwanted boys are sold to the bearded priests. These slave soldiers are often used as peacekeepers in Norvos. Now, Ariel was also not alone in his long axe training. All these boys are trained with the axe, and at 16 they do something that's called wed their axe, which I think he referenced in this chapter, and that is simply swearing vows. What is less simple and probably far more painful is the axe-shaped branding that they receive on their chest that Ario itches even the this many years later in this chapter here. Ouch. As Ario tells us, this is a reminder to keep their axe sharp. One other thing I'll mention, um, because it's the only time it, it comes up so far in our story, is that Ario talks about the three bells of Norvos. So I'll expound a bit on his thoughts because this is not very clear. He recalls Noom, Nara, and Niall, but doesn't explain who or what they are. At first, I thought they were his siblings, but it's actually the names of the three bells. The bells tell the city's inhabitants what to do for nearly everything. Wake, sleep, work, rest, take up arms, pray, when they're allowed to have sex. So basically, they're just my wife in bell form now that I think about it. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. Uh, Ario mentions that each bell has a distinctive sound, and that's why they have three different names. Well, that's awesome. That's really good background. Thank you. All right. Certainly. Compars- comparison with the television show. In a simplification, Ilaria Sand, um, Oberyn's paramour, is the one who demands the action of Doran at the Water Gardens. She wants to send Marcella back one piece at a time, and his oh. response is very much like it is in the book, you know, calm and let's, you know, Oberyn was to blame for his own death, that kind of thing. Marcella right. and Tristane appear to be getting on very well. The actress that played Marcella changed, and it seems she aged several years while on that interminable journey from King's Landing, <laughs> so that actually <laughs> tracks. <laughs> Uh, later on in the show there is a scene where with Ilaria and the three main sand snakes the ones we met here in in which Obara makes her speech about the tears and the spear so that is kept but it's pushed later on in the show okay okay Pedantricona uh, Pedantricona just for brevity I'm actually going to 
trim this all down because I've got a huge pedantry corner here, but it's actually a very marginal piece of pedantry. But just I got onto a kick. I'll save I, it. Yes, for, you did. <laughs> I'll save it for a rainy day. But okay. Uh, the point is, so Maester Kelliot is that his name? Yeah, Kelliot. That's Mr. how Kelliot I've been pronouncing it. Is looking after uh, Prince Doran, and Prince Doran suffers from gout, and gout is. I, I don't have gout, but I have arthritis in my big toes, and it hurts a lot. And I think gout is a worse form of arthritis, where the uric acid builds up. It must be really horrible. I bet. I've complained for a while that with thousands of years, the maesters should have got further with medicine. Their medicine feels medieval, and it should have moved on more. Sure, yeah. You've mentioned and this so a few times. I have. I've absolutely mentioned this. And, and I felt particularly sore for Prince Doran at this point. And so I, I decided to harp on it. But they should be applying the scientific method to their to their work. They should be doing hypothesis tests, you know, and revise and publish that. They should publish these things so that all the maesters can read it. And this would lead to advances in science. Um, but then I read up a little bit on historic and modern cures for gout and there is an anti-inflammatory called colchicine that is prescribed today for gout that was first used to treat gout in 500 BC. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're on the same pace as the Citadel. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing has changed here. So it cracked me up. I was like, oh my goodness, that's ridiculous. So I, I, I know nothing. I know nothing at all. And now I'm going to skip over the longest thesis I've ever written on the history of science. It's basically the history of science. And <laughs> I, I will summarize it. I'll, I'll do this one day. One day when I complain up against the, about the maesters and their science, again, I'll do this whole thing. I'll keep it for the rainy day. But I will say that all of this made me realize just how important the, 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 the definition of a temperature scale was. Fahrenheit in 1706 and then Celsius in 1740 really pushed science forward a huge leap with what they did, particularly Celsius, Celsius, because Fahrenheit was crazy and nobody in the right mind would use the Fahrenheit scale to this day. But, you know, <laughs> just nobody. <FYI. laughs> Makes no sense. <laughs> but I mean, like an enormous number of things. I, I, distillation of ethanol out of wine. How do you know you've got pure ethanol? Well, the test, I know what the test is. The test of any liquid is its boiling point. If you test its boiling point, you look it up against a table of known boiling points of pure substances. And if it boils at the same temperature, you've got that substance. Well, how do you do that if you can't measure the temperature? Yeah, good stuff. There's a, right? th there's a lot more where that came from, but I'll save it for another I, day. All right. There is. There definitely is. I have to scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, so news and notes. Um, I'll, I'll do the first part of this. Thank you for the efforts you're putting in on the five star ratings on Apple Podcasts. We're continuing to rise up the ranks there. If you're using an iPhone to listen to us, uh, even if you're on Spotify and you like what we're doing, please consider opening the Apple Podcasts app and giving us a five star rating. And that's all you need to do. We'll be very grateful. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And speaking of such things, we have a wonderful review from wagma from dk wagma from dk from apple podcast denmark i think dk stands for denmark so wagma yeah from i denmark. bet you're right yeah. i bet you're right yeah uh, the subject is five star podcast i like it already fantastic and then a, a little what is that symbol there the that's like you're cool yeah. man right like uh, cool <laughs> Fantastic. Have been listening to you since mid-2023 and have loved every bit. I listen on Spotify, but came here to leave a review and some stats. Oh. What what a great uh, what a great example well, of what we were doing. Someone just talking who actually about. listens to us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I came across your podcast while searching for a way to refresh the books before the next and without reading them, and I found the best way possible. My favorite parts are, of course, the discussion after the summary and the intro where you share bits about your life. Always make me smile. Keep up the good work. 
Lots of love from Denmark. Oh, that's awesome. I, I remember when we talked to um, Sustainer Steve and he said that he said that the one thing he hates about podcasts is where they talk about things that aren't the podcast. And he said, <laughs> but the one thing I love about your podcast is the bit you do before you start the podcast. <laughs> I was <Yes>. like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, as long as you like it. <laughs> well, thank you so very much, Wagma from DK. We, yeah, that's that beautiful. Was a great review. We really appreciate that. Thank you. All right, let's conclude. So Dawn is in uproar over Oberyn's death, but Doran is right. It was in fair combat before the gods. Uh, and actually, if anyone was cheating, it was Doran. He's the one with the poison blade. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but the Sand Snakes are going to be a handful. Uh, you know, even even in prison, I feel they're going to cause Doran trouble. Yes. It, it, just getting them. When, when he gave... Oreo, that task of rounding them up, I was like, oh, yeah, you say that. Like, it's no <laughs> yeah. big deal. Like, just go round up the sand snakes. <laughs> now, uh, Oreo is like, it'll be done. And he's probably thinking, oh, goodness, how am I going to do this? <laughs> but the sand snakes are clearly going to be great additions to the story if, 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 if they're not just confined to a cell for the rest of the time, which right. I, I, assume, yeah. I assume is not Doran's long-term plan. But... Uh, the prince seems to have decided to work with Tywin, but he doesn't know that Tywin is dead. So will this change his calculus? Will that lead to the idea of crowning Marcella gaining traction for him? I could see that happening. Yeah, I, on on a few levels, without Tywin, I think you would feel more comfortable and secure in crowning Marcella. On one hand, there's you'd be a bit less concerned about a coordinated, well-planned-out attack without the true ruler of Westeros at the moment being <laughs> Tywin Lannister. Without him, you know, you'd be like, ah, we might be able to take our chances here. Yep. Uh, but also, you'd have to figure that King's Landing is going to be busy dealing with the fallout from his death and therefore might be a great opportunity to crown Marcella and send out ravens all over the realm saying we've got a new queen of the seven kingdoms come pay homage yeah I mean you, you, you're not taking that much of a risk really you know the only thing is what are you actually gaining from it your your son is married to the queen of the seven kingdoms but she's in absentia she's right. yeah. confined to dawn your hope your greatest hope would be that something happens to Tommen because then the rest of the Seven Kingdoms will be like, well, she's already crowned. Let's just bring her in, you know. Right. Yeah, Tommen isn't yeah. going to isn't going to have children for a while. So, uh, yes, and uh, another heir is is several years off at least. Exactly. Exactly. Unless he's on the uh, Oberyn Martell path, then it might <laughs> be just around the corner. But uh, speaking of Marcella, she's stuck in the middle here. Ty Tyene wants to use her as a pawn to draw the Lannisters in. Nymeria, like I said earlier, Nymeria thinks of Tommen as an abomination of incest. And if that's and the case, therefore, then Marcella mm -hmm. is too. So, you know, she's she's being used by at least proposed to be used by the Sand Snakes in various different ways, and she's she's stuck. I and if you throw in Elaria in the TV show, chopped into pieces and sent home. So, you know, there's all, <laughs> yes. ki all kinds of fates awaiting yeah. Marcella. Right. Uh, anyway, my bottom line of this chapter is I'm going to stop underestimating Doran Martell. Still waters run deep and all that. Good plan. Good plan. I, he's got a lot of time to sit and think. Exactly. Exactly. It's not just watching the kids splashing in the pools. His mind is going to wander to... Plans and schemes. Yes, I think that's possible. All right, next week I've looked ahead for once, and we have another. <laughs> we have another first time POV, and it's the first named POV of this book, and it's a character you know only too well. And oh boy, you are going to want to find out who. Yeah, we've been wanting to get into the mind of this character for a long time, mm -hmm. so we're looking mm -hmm. forward to it. Mm -hmm. By the way, on the side project, I am reading. Uh, a dance with dragons boiled leather style alongside this oh cool uh, good, good. maybe I, I should too then well it's it's too much like hard work honestly i mean <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a lot on our plates mckelly we can't be doing this but i i'd forgotten that it, there's a the whole preface to dance with dragons invites it 
because it says, you know, this is the same time period as the last book. So I thought right. people were just being crazy and just like interleaving <laughs> bits of book. I was like, why would you do this? It all fell into place once I read that. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. There's four ways that you could help us. You could leave us a positive review, as Wagmar from DK did. You could buy merchandise at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall. Join us at any of the various sustainer levels, the upper ones of which give you the spoiler chat, which is where we put our funny jokes. Uh, and <laughs> That's what we do, yes. <laughs> and there is a tier to match any budget. Uh, or you can just make a donation directly to our course at ghostofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keep up on the latest Ghost of Heron Hall news and developments, you can check us out on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.